Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm happy again, once again, to be here sharing um, also my participation in this uh, conference. Uh, this is uh, not, uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, our, our work, the title of our, our research is going to be understanding the perception towards the technology adoption in higher education institutions in, my, in Omani. Myself, Benson, and uh, I'm also doing this research together with um, a fellow researcher, Dr. Masengu Rizen. Um, these, are our, our, uh, these are our credentials, right? So my, present, in my presentation is going to follow this uh, structure, the introduction, the objectives, literature review, and then the discussion. Since it's not uh, a full uh, paper, it's still it's just discussion. So there are not going to be any results to, uh, to talk about and any, any findings, any conclusions. So that's the structure of my presentation. Um, uh, I can say that uh, what motivated this research was uh, uh, some of the background that we get, like uh, what Tahine and Hon said, they posit that successful implementation of e-learning tools depends on the perception of the users and their knowledge and skills in using computers. It's something that we have seen given the developments of like uh, the pandemic, where uh, everything now you have to do it online, use computers and when we're talking of computers, we're only not limited to laptops and maybe desktops, but even handsets, any gadget that can be used. So it has permeated nearly every aspect of people's lives to use technology uh, as we communicate even at family levels. So even the education sector has not been left behind in this exodus. Globally, the growth in the use of technology to support collaborative learning in institutions of higher learning has attracted a rapidly growing number, growing number of research studies focused on some aspect of technology supported collaborative learning examined from the theoretical perspective. Where we're looking from at this point from the uh, point of view that when uh, people are learning, they need to be supported and there should be collaboration uh, between uh, stakeholders, the learner, the learners themselves, the instructors, and even the administrators who are supporting uh, towards the, the outcome. And this uh, computer or supported collaborative um, idea, it was mooted as early as 1989, according to the research that we've come so far. So these are the objectives of our research. We want to uh, identify technologies that are ideal and applicable to higher education institutions. Uh, we also want to establish opportunities that are presented by these technologies as they are used in higher education institutions. Um, we also want to find out the requirements for technology savvy generation in higher education institutions. When we come to this point, I think we saw, uh, we experienced even ourselves that a good example is myself. When um, I was doing my undergrad, I remember the class, there was only one guy who had a, a laptop then. The rest of us, we did not have the way we were collaborating with our instructors was we had to uh, write everything or had to go to some other place to have our assignments typed and then hand over to our lecturers. So that again was something that was uh, taxing and you know everything. So looking at literature here, techn technology acceptance model, which, is, which has been referred to as the term, uh, is an adoption of uh, theory, reasoned action specifically tailored for modeling user acceptance of information systems. So you're looking at coming up with some uh, gadgets or information technology systems that 
the users are going to uh, accept it because if they fail to accept that, I think it could be disastrous. So technology acceptance model is considered one of the well-known models related to technology acceptance, uh, according to PAC. It has shown great potential in explaining and predicting user behavior in information technology. So this uh, uh, technology acceptance model has got some perceptions uh, around it. Uh, it has got uh, two fundamental elements the perceived ease of use as well as the uh, perceived usefulness wherein if you look at the perceived ease of use you are somebody saying the gadget or the system or the technology how easy it is it for me to navigate to use it to carry it uh, and so forth and even the use of, is it useful in achieving the uh, the objective of the learner the objective of the uh, instructor who is instructing the objective of the institution. So those are things that uh, uh, dovetail around uh, these questions. The main mechanisms underlying perceived use of uh, ease of use are system design and features. So it looks at the design, the features of the uh, technology that is to be used. Uh, whereas the core mean underlying perceived usefulness is effort in decreasing. So again, you are looking at reducing the effort that you somebody is doing when he's using that. Uh, I, I kind of even go back to look at some of the uh, technologies that we, we started using even way back that I'm talking about doing my undergrad and then going uh, into industry first where I still remember we, went, we had the eight inch floppy disk, uh, three inch floppy disk, uh, the and so forth and so forth. So all those things now, I'm, I'm just, I've seen the evolution of technology all these years. Theory of reasoning action uh, is driven by the behavioral intention, which is one of the functions of individual attitudes and subjective norms of the behavior in, in question. So now this behavior now we're saying, uh, is somebody going to easily accept and be able to use whatever technology has been presented to them or is made available to them. So even in designing uh, whatever technology that we want to uh, make uh, the, 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 the learner uh, have what the information that we want. So I think even institutions, they have to think along those lines to say, is it easy for them to use? Are they going to accept that? So, and if we have done that, I think we can look at also the factors that we need to look at, which can be impede or which can um, uh, fast track or help. So you look at such things like uh, inadequate ICT and e-learning infrastructure. So in some cases, uh, like in my country, I think Zimbabwe, we have uh, had some challenges uh, of this pandemic, especially in uh, primary and secondary education, where uh, students uh, or the government has actually failed to uh, embrace or to say uh, embrace technology, because it, when they look at the all-inclusive um, uh, mantra to say, now we, we need to look at and, and, and include everybody, there are some people who cannot afford the, the gadgets, like especially in the rural areas. Again, even in town, those who are in urban areas, you find the, the expenses of data and what have you, all those things now. So those are inhibiting factors now you want to implement, but they are in, inhibiting factors. Financial constraints, it needs money even to construct the infrastructure. It needs man even to, uh, again, make sure that you are maintaining the infrastructure. Lack of affordable and adequate internet bandwidth. I think I've said that in some cases, like in Zimbabwe, we are affected by such things like um, power uh, uh, outages. Those are some of the things that do affect my country. Lack of operational e-learning policies where there is no policy. For instance, to say when you are using uh, like a Moodle or a ma management learning facility of a particular, you are not supposed to be uh, posting things that are not uh, good, right? 
So if there is no such policy, you'd find then you have other characters. I still remember one of the days I asked my, my child, why are you having these uh, groups? Then they, because they were posting things that are not good on, on, on WhatsApp group, group learning one at WhatsApp, because there is no policy to say anyone who has done this is going to be dealt with in this way. So you find again, that's something that is prohibiting. Lack of technical skills uh, on e-learning and content development by the teaching staff. Teaching staff themselves, if you look at maybe somebody who, uh, who started teaching like 25 years ago, and if they have not been learning how to use technology, it means now they are not comfortable given even such uh, development like uh, the pandemic that we have, you cannot teach face-to-face -face and all of a sudden you are supposed to teach uh, online. Lack of in interest and commitment among teaching staff, then the amount of also of time that is required in developing e-learning content. I think this, this is something that also has to be looked at because there is much, much time uh, that is required. But however, there are benefits that are reaped, such as is uh, of access to information. Once we have maybe gone to that stage where we are now using technology, uh, the learners, they can access that any anytime, and there's no doubt about it. Anytime, anyway, they can access that. The potential for interactivity amongst and between the learners and the teachers, they can interact again with, learn, uh, with the teachers anytime and among themselves then enables conduct of lessons from a remote location. Yes, uh, that's actually what we enjoyed even when um, COVID struck. We quickly had to move, like here in, in where I am, we quickly had to move to uh, teaching students online. Content is more timely, consistent, and bendable with potential reuse. So again, you, you can make sure that you are refining your content all the time and make it, ensure that it's up to date. Then you can also make use of blended learning where you, you have a, high, sorry, a hybrid, the face-to-face -face as well as the online learning. Stu supports student centered uh, e-learning and training. Now, when we're talking of students, Leonard, we, I mean, saying that you're saying now even the students themselves, they have to take initiative in learning. They have to uh, start uh, even uh, giving themselves time to say, this is the time that is I will set aside for my studies and so forth, right? Support students, say that learning and training opportunity, e-learning or lowers costs, improves a cost effectiveness. Yes, at first, the cost of uh, setting up infrastructure, training, and so forth is high, but as you move, you find that the cost now, they will be lowered. Offers the combination of education with family and work, yes, for the uh, those who are now old and so forth, they enjoy that. Again, even scalability, it's also part of it, then facilitates the management of student records and tracking, uh, uh, of students, especially on the management side there, you, you do have a record from the time that they enroll, the time that they are progressing through uh, all their semesters. Uh, even during the semester, when you want to see their records for continuous assessment, you can, you can have that, right? The methodology that we, uh, we look forward to be using is a cross-sectional survey of literature, uh, objective and subjective methods of data, collection also will be used there. We will use the convenient sampling where we are only targeting maybe higher education institutions. And uh, uh, in particular, we might even look at particular maybe um, um, like sectors to say, okay, let's look at the business we, because we you can't embrace everything. Let's look maybe at the business. Uh, You've got two minutes. Okay, okay. Then the structured question and same structured for interviews there will be used, right? Then um, the discussion that we have here is change is inevitable. I think we've seen it, especially in the last 20 years, uh, given even like the uh, COVID-19 that has shifted even the mode of delivery then the skills also are changing, which even requires uh, teaching 
uh, learners how to use ICT even from college so that even when they go to work, when they start even their own um, businesses, they are able to use, because even if you have, if you are an entrepreneur, you need to communicate with people, you need to use social media. So that's part of ICT. Then blended learning forces us to consider digital technology in general and ICT specifically, where ICT tools uh, can process information on their own, just like what we do as humans. So uh, these are our refu uh, references and uh, thank you so much for your precious time. Any questions? I'm Stipora Zivindelo from Cape Peninsula University of Technology, where I teach mathematics education. Um, I investigated a wikis. In fact, uh, since I was working with pre service teachers, and then I gave them this assignment to do on a wiki page. They would create their own page. So this motivated me to, to, to investigate the use of wikis. But I focused only on the advantages and disadvantages of using wikis in mathematics teaching and learning. What is also motivated me is, is the COVID-19. The COVID-19 has motivated all of us to use, uh, to teach online. And uh, since we are using Blackboard as our learning management system, and I've been navigating that, that platform and I would realize that there are so many tools we never used. Even if we meet as colleagues and we discuss, I, I never heard of any colleague mentioning wikis, mentioning the use of other platforms, except for uh, Blackboard Collaborate and discussion forums. So hence, I decided to explore this platform. It was not easy because it was also my first time to, to use that, that, that platform. Experience for both me and my students this has been used in teacher education. What I have discovered is that there's few empirical studies that investigated uh, mathematics education. Sipokasi, no, we, we, can I just interrupt you? Your sound is not very good. I don't know whether there's something you can do on your side. Get Maybe closer to the mic. Have been struggling since yesterday. I don't know this. Um, is it fine now? Okay, yeah, let's let's try. Carry on, please. Okay. And I also looked at the literature. I have I, I focused only on the advantages and disadvantages, and then I selected a few. So one of the advantages is that oh, is that when students use wikis, those wikis um, encourage students to generate their own knowledge of which it's something that we, we, we is, is that we need for mathematics teaching. We want our students to, to be able to generate their own knowledge. And then again, the and wikis encourage students to, to read, to be able to read and to write. And you know, uh, mathematics students, I know from my experience, I never liked uh, theory stuff. So when you see this, like when you try, let's say you are given this word problem, where you are expected to read, to read, to get bored. So at least the use of wikis would encourage them to read and uh, to write. And again, it also encourages an um, active learning community as students will be working together, as they will be collaborating. So that, that will enhance them. The, 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 the learning of the, the active learning community. Uh, there are also disadvantages um, of using wikis. Uh, wikis, we, we know there are students who prefer working individually instead of working with other, with other students. So when they use this, this platform, it's like they are, those students who prefer to work individually are not uh, accommodated. Unfortunately, they, they, they had to adapt because 
That was the platform that we were using for that assignment. And again, students become reluctant and afraid to use technology. I like this point, and it's not only students who become reluctant, even us as lecturers, I was also, to be honest, I was reluctant and I was also afraid because it was my first time to use this, this, this platform. And then I said, okay, but now I will be working with C because I had few students since we're phasing out the old PGCE, I teach PGCE. So we're phasing out that program and then we're left with few students, they were seven. I said, you know what, this is my chance to, to use these few students to explore this platform. So I was also afraid it's not only them who become reluctant and afraid of using this technology. And, uh, and again, the literature highlighted that teachers failed to address the use of weakness. I think this, this point is not fair enough to teachers as, as again, from my experience, I know that teachers were not exposed. In fact, they are not exposed to these kind of like witches. And some of these courses we work with pre-service teachers, some of these schools, they don't even have these resources. So I don't think it's fair to say teachers fail to address the, the use of wikis. We may say maybe the, the, the lecturers who at least we have these resources fail to, 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 to address the use of wikis since, I, since they don't, they don't um, explore other platforms. As I have mentioned that I never, I never met any colleague who was, would, would say, I used wikis, I used, they, they have been using Blackboard or collaborate uh, discussion forums and other platforms, but not wikis, more especially in mathematics education. And the literature also made, also highlighted that uh, wikis is time consuming. I believe that every online platform is time consuming because there's a lot to do, you have to prepare for everything. And sometimes it's, it's, it's something new, you'll be using this platform for the first time. So it needs time, it needs time. So yes, it's not only weekends that are time consuming. So all those platforms are time consuming. And I was hoping that this, this this uh, paper would contribute to my practice, the, the teaching practice. Since I work with pre-service teachers, and again, I mean, as lecturers who prepare teachers to prepare students to become mathematical teachers, it, it, this platform, I mean, this this paper would help us to to use different platforms when we teach to, to use different platform platforms to engage our students because students get bored. If you use one platform, they get bored. And it was also to it was also going to contribute to the professional development because when exploring different different platforms, it's like I am developing myself as a lecturer. Uh, I used a survey and um, I worked with seven pre-service teachers. Yes, I have mentioned that we, I only had seven students since we were phasing out the old PGCE. So they were, they, I gave them this assignment. So I wanted them to reflect on that assignment. I wanted their feedback, but their feedback was not based on the content of the assignment. It was based on the use of of, of, of this platform because that assignment was a group assignment. So they were expected to use Wiki to complete that as or to do that assignment. And then the results. Again, the results are focused again on the, the survey focused on the advantages and disadvantages of using the Wikis. And the students mentioned that uh, Wikis enhancing enhance um, reading and writing skills. And it's very interesting because even the, the, the literature uh, argued this point that the, use, or the, the advantage of using wikis in, is, to, is to enhance reading and writing, uh, and writing skills. And it also enhance uh, collaboration skills. 
So at least as they were expected to collaborate, so there was that collaboration enhancement. As, as they were collaborating, they were also sharing ideas. So in this case, they were sharing ideas remotely, hence saying these weeklies are flexible. There was no need for physical contact when sharing those ideas. One student would just post whatever idea they have, and then one would come and add it or add something. So it was flexible in that way. And they were able to use various online tools, even though they mentioned they mentioned challenges they experience in terms of the, of those uh, tools. Sorry, you've got and about these, five minutes left. And these are the disadvantages. Some of the students mentioned that yes, they are familiar with wikis, but they normally use those who are familiar with wikis, they use wikis casually, not in mathematics education. And other students said, no, they never used wikis. And um, another disadvantage is that when you use wikis, they need blackboard. So they, 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 and again, there's a lack of mathematical tools. We know that math, mathematics requires different tools. So when using wikis, you, you don't, you don't have access or you don't have those mathematical, you don't, you don't have sufficient mathematical tools. This graph shows, um, uh, those students who are familiar with wikis. So 29% um, of students said, okay, we are, we are familiar with wikis, but what, what in mathematics um, education? And then 71% um, said, no, 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 we are not familiar with, with, um, with wikis. And then this one, the next one, this one is part of the, um, of this slide, let me go back to this. For, for further investigation, I've mentioned that it would be interesting to read more about using wikis in and out of school environment, since we know that some of the schools don't have these resources. And again, it would be interesting again to read more on whether these wikis, wikis can be used as an alternative tool to teach mathematics. But students had the problem to say to, to answer the, 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 the second the second point, um, twenty nine percent of these students said no, we cannot use they cannot be used as an alternative tool, and then forty three percent said yes they can be used as an alternative tool, and then twenty eight said not yet since we don't have resources. We need to have those resources in place before we can use those switches. I think I have covered what I have prepared to present. Thank you. Um, I would like to share research with you today titled uh, The Lecture Read Readiness and the Uptake of Digital Technologies in, in Distance Education. Um, this is the overview that I would like to address with you um, and sharing the findings and the recommendations that um, emanated from this study. Just to give you a little bit of background on the study, uh, the study took place in an African, a Southern African private higher education institution in Zambia. It was a case study uh, and the, the private higher education uh, institution um, has online distance teaching and learning, and we looked at the education faculty specifically. The question asked was, are the lecturers ready to include technology in their current teaching and learning? And what we wanted to ascertain is what are the current perceptions and experiences when it comes to teaching with a, a technology? Um, are they familiar with, with some of the affordances that could lead to more enhanced 21st century skills transfer. Uh, just to put you in, uh, give some context of this case study in Zambia, Zambia has significant acts and regulations, uh, so, some very recent and updated acts like the Higher Education Act of Zambia, looking at accreditation of all 
higher education institutions. There's also a 2006 national ICT policy that is quite valuable. Um, there is also a, a, a African project that was run in 2018, looking at standards and protocols when it comes to integrating technology and distant learnings. Uh, it is very important to note that there are 60 accredited private higher education institutions in Zambia alone, compared to the six public higher education institutions. All these reports and some of the literature would allude to ICT infrastructure lacking and all the challenges that is uh, uh, that comes with that. So uh, Farrell and Isaac already in 2007 alluded to specifically in Zambia, the problem of digital literacy and digital fluency, both with students as well as lecturing staff. Looking uh, at, at what the literature can, can teach us about private higher education in, South, uh, in Southern Africa, in Africa, and looking at, at important reports, uh, such as those from UNESCO and OECD, that, gives quite, that give quite a lot of insight and guidance in terms of enhancing teaching with technology. Um, but then again, the, the, the study of Corodia, it's, it's a leading study, explains that the, the disruptive change can really come up with really problematic scenarios, especially when it comes to developing countries. One of the areas that stood out from the literature is that many authors and scholars refer to the phased or the staged approach where the development of a higher education institution or teaching and learning to, to teach with technology um, is, is really faced where you find that from stage one, where you have very limited digital technology right through to stage five, where you can effectively start referring to communities of learning, communities of practice, um, and where you do find that there is augmented and virtual learning taking place both synchronously and asynchronously. But when it comes to this study, we have to find a framework and we found that Mishra and Kula's, uh, Kula's uh, TPAC framework was really well suited. And if we look at what Mishra and Kula said in 2006, when it comes to lecturer skills and, and knowledge, they say a teacher with deep pedagogical knowledge understands how students construct knowledge acquire skills and develop habits of mind and positive disposition toward learning. And that is really key. So we found that looking at this study through the lens of Kula and Mishra's TPAC framework was well suited, uh, where they look at the primary foci, primary foci of content, technology and pedagogy and looking at where those overlap. Very important is not only where these these spheres overlap, but it's also the context in which this happens. And it became evident from this study that the context was really key. So it was a constructive interpretive this paradigm that was followed, mainly qualitative and exploratory. Uh, and it was a focus group. And um, once the data were collected, there was a thematic analysis. Uh, data triangulation was uh, uh, conducted. Um, so triangulation is described by Denzel as, as a, a deep understanding of the top topic under study. Uh, and in this case, teaching and learning with, um, with a targeted group. And this is how the data were um, triangulated. First of all, the focus group interview was um, recorded and transcribed and checked for, for correctness. There were direct uh, researcher observation fields note, notes taken, as well as extended researcher observations. So when it then comes to the TPAC frames and, and, and areas, we found that yes, valuable information could have were, were obtained when looking at the, the, the three foci of TPAC, but 
that the contextual themes that uh, surfaced from the, the, this study was that themes like governance profile, student profile, and infrastructure was just as important as lecturer skills when it came to the uptake and the readiness of lecturers to incorporate and use teaching with technology. Very briefly, findings. Um, the content knowledge and the pedagogical content knowledge, <coughs> we found that lecturers were really well equipped. They were well qualified. Um, they were very serious about uh, student student centeredness, and they were most of them were busy with further research. When it, however, came to techn technological content knowledge, there were definitely gaps. Um, and they displayed a very good and a deep understanding of the pedagogic, pedagogical knowledge. And there was some evidence of micro learning that was done informally and from their own accord, where they would make use of OER videos. Uh, one of the, the respondents said, I use social constructivism and we interact a lot. Students learn from each other and I learn all the time. So participants were initially a little bit hesitant to go into um, explanations about ped pedagogy that they followed, but when prompted, it was quite clear that, that their uh, pedagogical content knowledge was really, really sound. Briefly, the summaries were that although, although lecturers are aware of the shift uh, to teach with technology, they were not supported. They had, they, the readiness was uh, char characterized with their willingness, absolute willingness to start incorporating teaching with technology, but their readiness was impaired by the contextual um, circumstances uh, in, in their organization, where they felt that the governance, that the top structure was not supportive or did not understand. And this then also connects with some of the utterances uh, yesterday, where a gap was identified between the understanding of, of the, man, the governance structures, the management of the institution towards uh, uh, and, and compared to, to re the real teaching and learning. So that was definitely in this case study identified as an issue. But on a broader context, if one sees that there are 60 private higher education institutions in Zambia alone, the question must be asked for further studies. What is, ha what is happening in other private higher education institutions? Are the, the, the gap that has been identified between teaching and learning and management, uh, are, are these issues being researched uh, on a broader level? especially if one takes into context and, and into consideration that the 2030 sustainable development goals for education and higher education is that there should be a, a tremendous shift towards teaching with technology uh, where students need to be prepared for 21st century skills. Um, what did also come out from the study is that mobile technology is being used uh, but not as effectively as is possible. And we've heard from other presentations during this past two days, what are the disadvantages and what are the challenges and hurdles when it comes to technology, data cost, et cetera. However, I am of the opinion that with good governance, these hurdles could be overcome. Um, through institutional st strategies, through guidance, through innovative ways of, of, of equipping both lecturers and, and students. And micro learning and mobile learning definitely have uh, a place here. In conclusion, it was found that uh, this particular private higher education institution is very much between phase or stage one and two. And although they consider themselves as an online um, private higher education institution, their technology support and teaching is lacking 
tremendously. And and there must and there's a dire need for that to be addressed because it seems that most of the technology goes into the administration of student records. Very good uh, uh, access there and and management of that. Where that uh, whereas it does not filter through to student experience and same student experience. So where the use of, of technology at current at the current stages are unstructured and informal through good governance, this should be formalized to make sure um, that what is envisaged on a ministerial level in Zambia is then also mirrored in practice, specifically in private higher education institutions. So the recommendations that, recommendations that came out of this study is that there is a dire need to improve e-learning, uh, specifically looking at mobile learning and, and bringing that in in a phased process uh, for just-in-time sharing of information. The understanding of micro-learning and micro-content um, towards improving digital literacies within among students is something that really needs to be explored further. There are also a number of areas that are could be that could be further researched, and that is the role of the ministerial uh, governance in the term in terms of teaching with technology, specifically pertaining to evaluating an accreditation of private higher education. Uh, so that the, the gap that there is between policy and implementation is addressed. Um, mobile learning in Africa is an area that it definitely needs to be researched much wider. And then if one looks at what uh, Suyutama and Sik Tiosari and the, uh, it else says, when designed for purpose, mobile learning offers students the opportunity to learn problem solving in a real life situation, which is underpinned by situated learning theories. And that is just some of the sources that also informed this study. And I would like to thank you for um, listening to, to this presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Um, thank you for, thank you for that chair. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for having us at the conference. Um, we're going to share some of our insight with you guys in, in terms of the study that we've conducted uh, at our institution. Just want to get to the next slide if it, if it behaves. All right, there we go. Okay, so in 2014, Keppel explored something in the paper uh, where Keppel looked at how places of learning might look in the next generation, right, from a physical and a virtual perspective, right, um, and in particular considering personal learn personalized learning strategies. Now, the reality is that when COVID hit, uh, we were still exploring this okay, all these years later. And um, that's something that we've been exploring pre-COVID. Uh, we've explored during COVID as well. And it's something we need to address um, even once COVID is gone. Okay. Um, in terms of the background and context, um, firstly, uh, Hodges et al. spoke about how uh, institutions are forced into uh, emergency remote teaching. It was unplanned. And there was a whole lot of guidelines given uh, in terms of how to engage with students online. But it wasn't something any institution had really planned for. We were just thrust into the into into online learning, and as academics, uh, we were interested in how students learn using technology, and it became even more of a question when we moved learning online. And um, a previous study that we conducted looked at um, the fact that students adopt different technologies when learning IT and programming. So whilst we might mandate as an institution a particular set of a particular platform to use, uh, students actually start adopting different technologies based on the nature of the, uh, what's the word? Okay. Yeah, the personal preference, right? Um, and then when analyzing YouTube statistics of our our own channel that we, we provide content to students, we observe the students are signing into the range of devices. Um, some of them even including gaming consoles, which we chat about just now, at different times of the day and on different days of the week. And some of the data which we are going to share was, was actually quite surprising. Okay, and then, um, Again, Keppel suggested that students learn using different physical and virtual spaces, right, as they traverse their learning journey, which featured in our study in terms of the platforms they chose and whether they prefer what physical space they actually prefer to be in. Okay, uh, in terms of previous literature, okay. So, basic learning uh, is aimed at how we can check students for the real world and how the learning opportunities we provide them 
get them to think and act like professionals. And this is particularly yeah. important for technology and teaching programming because students would have to learn how to translate skills very easily and how to find information. So I think in teaching programming, it's almost become more important to teach students how to evaluate and find accurate sources is much more important than teaching them like clear syntax, because syntax mm -hmm. changes so very often. Maybe hit the next one. So what we were interested in and what we saw is that when you start braiding technologies and communication strategies and things together, and students start building almost their personal braid of how they study programming, like the technologies they use, the platforms they use, and how they braid these together in a highly personalized manner for the first time, the COVID has done a lot of horrible things. And I think it's put educators in a very awkward disposition. But not everything COVID did was bad because what came out here is how students were actually afforded the chance to braid together technologies, platforms, peer learning, all the tools available to them to build a highly personalized learning strategy. So if we look at the questions that Keppel said you should ask students about personalized learning and what it should look like, she spoke about comfort, she spoke about aesthetics, flow, and I'm not going to read through all the words on the slide, equity, how they blend things, the affordances, and how they repurpose um, the, the resources and tools that they have. So what we want to show in the rest of our study is actually how our students refer to all of these, <laughs> all of this came out of our study. And that students blend technology to learn in their own ways, and, and that they actually do seek comfort, certain aesthetics, flow is important to them. And we'll show that as we go through the data. Okay, onto the methodology. Okay, so uh, we utilized a mixed methods approach. Um, we conducted a survey, right? Um, we did have informal WhatsApp chats with our students just generally through the year, but predominantly for what we were presenting here in the paper will be uh, the survey and the YouTube analytics. Um, we issued a survey to 372 IT students um, and we collected 135 responses. And we took those responses, uh, we conducted thematic analysis and uh, a little bit of descriptive statistics to understand uh, you know, how students' grades would look. And that's what we're going to present to you now. So in terms of the devices utilized, uh, it was very interesting because, in fact, what we saw on, on the YouTube stats first was that gaming consoles were something that students were utilizing to access the YouTube channel and watch videos about programming on a gaming console. And then it was even entering the lounge in terms of a TV. Um, it, it piqued our curiosity to actually understand how students learned. And then when we asked them in the survey, which is what you see on the top left corner, uh, what devices you used to learn, gaming consoles also featured there. Okay? Um, so predominantly they would use their PC or their laptop as they would do on campus, as they would take, go home, work on their laptops, their desktops, which was, which was pretty, you know, we, something we observed. But what we weren't aware of was the fact that they were using other devices in other spaces, okay? And um, as we dug deeper, we got into study times and days. So we tried to ask them, you know, what, what, when, when in the day do you prefer to study? And we'll dig a bit deeper into this, but we have lectures in the morning and lectures in the afternoons. Uh, most of our students are actually studying evenings at night before midnight or in the early hours of the morning. So the when they study is actually very really different to when lectures are happening. And this is what COVID's given them the realization that they can study uh, relatively independently at a time that works for them. Yeah, as well as how many of the students um, would actually reach out to us for support um, at really odd times. Mm -hmm. We are old school people, like five o'clock your day ends, and this gen new generation is definitely no longer the case. Um, and we need to just say that the students were very respectable. They were mm -hmm. not um, like wanting answers 24-7. But they would, a question would pop up in your WhatsApp at two o'clock in the morning and when mm -hmm. they were working and then you could answer it the next day. So we also found it that we started blending synchronous and asynchronous communication with students to um, try and accommodate them through COVID. But it's just interesting to note that a small percentage of them actually really want to work in the day. The most of them work through that few meeting hours. As you know, the days of the week, it's not a typical work week. The level of engagement on a Friday and a Sunday, uh, as students reported themselves, was was fairly similar. So Friday is effectively uh, equivalent to the weekend, right? If we, if we could argue that, and Saturday is, is is the lowest engagement. But they almost on a Monday start growing, 
And um, it's not that, you know, we have lectures five days a week and we're going to study five days a week. It's not necessarily the case. And then if we, if we look at YouTube and what was going on with YouTube videos and the stats that we had, um, we found interestingly that um, they weren't, yeah, they, they, they were peaking on a Thursday evening. They were, they were quite blue on a Sunday, which was when we thought students were actually resting, or rather purple on a Sunday when we thought students were actually resting. So it's very different from what we envisioned and the way we offer our teaching and learning to our students. Yeah, so it's interesting in that, that what students believe and what actually happens, and which is why we started triangulating the data, because they really don't believe that they were. Sorry, we can't really hear you. Just try coming nearer to the mic. We um, found it interesting that students didn't list Sunday as the day that they really work on, but if you triangulate the data between what students say and what students do, you will see that actually Sunday is the day that they access most of our YouTube content. Um, if we dug deeper into the study hours, there were some trends that emerged. I'm not going to go through all the, the data, but just the themes. So late nights, uh, late evenings at night mean more focus for students, less distraction from family, work, peers, and so on. Um, early morning enabled the fresh start for some students, uh, allowed them to focus, also had less distractions for them. Um, some students like traditional mornings where they started the day with a clear mindset. But um, interestingly, we found that mental health was important. Some students set boundaries where they, certain days they don't rest, uh, sorry, they, they rest and they don't work. And um, certain at certain times they actually stop working. And what I have in your screen here is how the highly personalized learning, even though there is- Sorry, we can't hear you. Just come closer before you start talking. So what we're hoping you will see here is how highly personalized learning has become. And um, even though we see themes here, even within the themes, there's variation. Okay, in terms of the days, some students take a day or two off, and it's not just that way. But some say Monday or <laughs> some say weekend, some say Fridays. Uh, some say work can happen on any day. Some feel I'll work when I'm most alert and motivated. So when it's the best time for me to study, that's what I'm going to study, not according to our timetable. Okay. Work governs when they study, so some people are actually working. So they only have Wednesdays and Thursdays. And if you, if you look at this data broadly, uh, you're left with one or two days in the week when all the students are available and actually willing to study. right? And some of them do stick to the standard work week because they want to prepare for industry. So very different um, behavior for different students and for different reasons as well. Okay. Uh, in terms of platforms, the students used to use to learn. So we asked them, you know, which platforms to use and tell us how frequently you use it. Um, Microsoft Teams emerged quite strongly um, as something they, they use frequently and became a go-to space. Um, it's good to see the programming students were refer to, referring to online resources like your W3 schools, Geeks for Geeks, documentation websites. Um, there was a strong affinity for YouTube as well. So other YouTube channels, and we'll, we'll, we'll unpack that in a few minutes. Maybe not ours, but other people's YouTube channels and why students uh, prefer that. Okay. Um, as we dig deeper in terms of the platforms, so there was a recurring theme of videos to enhance understanding, right? So they wanted something they could search simply for to understand, they could rewind, go back and forth. And it even helped students who had uh, conditions like ADHD that needed them to engage with something that would keep them con more concentrated as opposed to a, a normal lecture. Uh, documentation sites are preferred because some people want to read code, okay? They want to understand how it works and why it works. And that of, uh, documentation sites offered that to them. Some people preferred platforms that offered features like notifications in a simple GUI. So they, if they got notifications, the class was starting, that's something that, that really worked for them because it encouraged them to attend class. And the concept of GUI came quite, quite strongly because the number of clicks that they needed to access content was, yeah, it, it, on Teams, it turned out to be less than other platforms that were available to them. Okay, and then um, we started seeing grades emerge. So if you look at the bottom here, um, some students use a combination of Microsoft documentation, YouTube videos, Stack Overflow, Microsoft Teams to get broad understanding and then build their own solution. Some said, okay, to understand, I go here, to enhance, I go somewhere else. And to understand more detail, uh, I'll go to where developers go. So it's quite a different, the, the, braid, the braids are starting to emerge and every student's braid is different. Okay, and that's what we're hoping emerges from here. The least preferred platform, some themes came up with usability challenges. Again, a lot of hoops to jump through. Some people didn't like the UI, but they're quite respectful that this is just my view, right? Um, and some people just preferred video, uh, but it didn't work for everybody, okay? And this is the, the view of personalization we have to consider, that um, some people loved videos, whereas others just simply didn't. Same with documentation sites. 
they like, oh, the developers are too opinionated <laughs> and they're not going to explain to me why it works. But other students felt the total opposite. That I understand why it works because I go to Stack Overflow, right? And then accessibility to resources. So our YouTube channel, uh, our videos, we've taken a decision in lockdown to keep them private, predominantly because we are scared. Right? We are scared to put our content out there because what if the world sees it and tells us how wrong we are, okay? Um, and the evidence we have in terms of where our students end up and stuff, it, it tells us the opposite story, but we have to overcome that fear. But that also inhibited students' ability to access the resources because it came up as a theme that they're not sure where to access them. They'd like to just search on YouTube and find a public video. And um, our videos are not listed. So it's something we need to reconsider as, as academics as well. Okay. So uh, well, one decision that we did make and um, when we decided to push learning onto our students, we realized that we had to give a lot of support and we made use of uh, teacher support clinics. And we were interested in how, if they are then really seeking personalized learning and we are trusting them to build their own brains, how do they seek support? Um, and what came out here is the real value of synchronous communication that they um, utilized WhatsApp and direct messaging the most. Um, so that they could get immediate responses if they were stuck. And like I said, luckily we built in resources with this in the, uh, by the way of tutors. But what we also found really interesting is that they would also start scaffolding here. So what the students would do is they would ask a direct message and they would get a short reply from a tutor. And if that wasn't enough, they'd move to a voice note. And if that wasn't enough, they'd move on to a video platform to provide different levels of support. Receiving the sample support staff. Sorry, just to check, you've got about a minute or two left. Sure, no problem. So, for sample queries, yeah, it was simply uh, going on WhatsApp, um, understanding the feedback, and um, harnessing the, the, the groups. But people were shy. But as it came for complex queries, uh, they started with IA, but as Sylvia says, they moved to more uh, platforms that allowed people to share screens, to just take over devices, and then they even went back to class to ask questions. So, we asked them to a perfect learning experience, right? And some people love online, some people love face-to-face, -face, and some people were somewhere in between. They give me the resources and I'll use them as I need. Right? In the interest of time, I'm just going to put students through this. They're perfect grade in terms of devices. I'm just going to bring this up on the screen. So different students use different devices in different ways. So some people use a laptop for one thing, a PC for something else, their phone for another thing. And there was a theme that, 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 that kept recurring. Even with platforms, some people want to collaborate, some want to team. I wanted to use Discord, and um, everyone used it in different ways. Okay? So in terms of our recommendations, uh, on the basis of constructivism, authentic learning, and personalized learning, uh, we recommend putting in place a broad framework. So give them learning as chapters or sections. Give them resources of different types to cater for everybody. Okay? Record everything, whether it's lectures, workshops, one-on-one -on -one sessions. Let them go back to the recordings and put in the support. So student tutors, lecture consultations, your learning spaces and yeah. So if you wanted to after things if events if a set up after COVID, I think COVID has taught us that what people ask, like what the personalized learning looked like. I think COVID pushed us deeper into personalized learning than we ever realized. So I think it's a learning opportunity for us to not lose. Will it always look this way? No, the, the structures we follow are too difficult. We are too entrenched in our ways. But if we wanted to keep this highly valuable and personalized learning, these are the things that we particularly are taking away, is that really leverage constructivism, let students build their own understanding using frameworks and resources that are comfortable for them. Teach them how to leverage good resources through authentic learning so that when they go to work, this is valuable to them. They know how to evaluate a resource whether it's good or not, and embrace personalized learning. Understand that in your class, that's a lot of students who one doesn't need you. One needs you immensely. <laughs> one is going to be comfortable on one platform and one is going to be comfortable on another. So I know it's a really scary space to let students go, but I, I, we believe there's great value in understanding this. If you look at the, 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 uh, the platforms we use, Netflix and Amazon, everything is personalized. Right? And we're building people who will be building these platforms. And if we really want to engage with them, we've got to start offering them content and resources to learn in a way that they become a customer. They'll spend hours on Netflix. They'll spend dollars and dollars on Amazon. Uh, yeah, we've got to start doing something along a similar line. So we've got to reconsider our role as a lecturer. The first casualty of COVID was the state, the state, the state because we are now facilitators. 
stop break all the time. Your students will laugh with us in that cafe. And if you're scared, let's let your fears be we'll all in this together and let's just be scared. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to share some findings with you from a project that we are busy with um, on a interdisciplinary collaborative project. And today we are going to just reflect um, on how this took place within the digital space. I am Caro van den Berg. I'm in the Department of Information Systems at UWC. And with me is Belinda Fester. Belinda is um, from the Department of Urban Planning at CPUT. Just some background on the project. We started this, uh, this the deliberating about the project um, in 2020, before the onset of COVID, when I realized that with my information system students, there was a lack of understanding in terms of deep, wicked problems within the community settings as we engaged on um, digital innovations within communities. And Belinda then came on board to kind of provide some perspectives on this as an urban planner, working very closely with communities and really understanding how one engages within these settings. We then decided to um, start a design-based research project to kind of look at ways that we can bring our students together to explore possibilities of social digital innovations um, with a real focus on the social uh, to look at problems within communities in Cape Town, South Africa. It was clear from the onset of this project that a, a pure practice-based intervention for this uh, quite complex learning space will not really suffice without a, a deeper dive into theory um, to frame our learning intervention. And this led to our engagement with social materiality as a theory that recognizes the social or the human realm as well as the material or the non-human realm. So uh, we started looking at this as a way to look at our interdisciplinary Plenary collaborative learning. So, if we look at socio materiality, um, for the social, we, we mean that it is everything, broadly speaking, related to how society is organized. Uh, generally speaking, human concerns that may include, for example, gender or relationships or social class or rules and norms that guide them. In, to look at this entangled nature of the social and the material in the setting. We then, with the onset of um, online learning, we very much had to then bring a broad scope in terms of the digital and how the digital interacted within our um, interdisciplinary collaborative learning space and how these theories of learning may be applied within these contexts. So the broad banner, if we think about social materiality, it really started to open up our thinking about this interconnected nature of technology and technology artifacts, more broadly speaking about the, the social digital innovations, but also in terms of the digital in our learning space and how humans and tech, how human and technology are kind of interfacing and how the one has an impact on the other. So it provided us with an opportunity to open up our thinking about this interconnected nature and how we can be more responsive to the entanglements um, and the potential impact of digital technologies. And furthermore, to look at how this 
can have an impact on marginalized communities within our student project. The methodology that we apply is design-based research, um, specifically uh, the four-step approach um, that was um, made more clear by Reeves. And within this, you kind of have an interactive or a, a systematic problem that you explore within certain iterations. So we really looked at our problem that we had within our learning environments and then started conceptualizing a design. And within this design, then we started looking at certain principles that we need to bring into our learning space and then start testing these principles within iterative cycles to kind of refine um, our design principles. We started, the, the pilot, as mentioned, started in, in 2020, and then our first iteration took place um, in, during this time to kind of start conceptualizing what, what these principles may be. And then we tested it um, in the second iteration in 2021, in the first semester of this year, and then we're planning a further iteration in 2022. The idea about the design-based research is to kind of come up with certain design principles or concepts and we frame this within um, our conceptual framework that is built on four pedagogical principles um, namely relationality, reflexivity, recognition, and responsiveness. Now, if we, if we look at that more closely, relationality is really um, a way to acknowledge that human and non-human entities and things are performed and continuously brought into being through relations. So instead of assuming that entities people and technologies have inherent properties, they're more seen as relational effects that are performed in a web of relations. So we believe that our students as future designers, um, be that in, in within information systems or urban planning, need to grasp the complexity of wicked problems that reside within our collective or social sphere and also the complexities that sit within this. So there's a collective voice that needs to come out. And how this collectiveness uh, comprises people, um, activities, communities, social relationships or social structures, and how we can use this to solve uh, problems. Within this, uh, we, we kind of premise four, four design principles, and that's uh, the awareness of local knowledge within uh, social material entanglements, um, the collective voice, so how communities have a voice or the voice of the communities, and then also the awareness of the complexity that resides within this. Looking at the broader framing of the social and the technical within this. With um, reflexivity, it's not looking at independent or detached ways of observing the world as out there, but rather to, to conceptualize the researcher ourselves or our students um, as elements of within this whole analysis. So reflexivity is part particularly important for us so that we can monitor where we are and what the entanglements are on a continuous basis. So looking at why we are busy with it, reflecting in action, what we're doing, a strong base where there's ethics and caring, um, 
self-awareness to understand and engage with um, who we are, our assumptions, our norms and values. Um, also, more an awareness of the concerns or norms or needs within a certain situation and reflect, reflecting on that. Um, empathy, understanding with and engaging with feelings of others, um, concerns with societal needs, uh, appreciating ethical reflections, so really being true to yourself and perspectives and of what, what our worldviews are, and very importantly, ways to kind of start disrupting how we're thinking and to appreciate different ways of thinking to disrupt the current status quo. With recognition, we, we, we look at possibilities of making a better world, a livable world, a world based on values of co-flourishing, um, working with one another, opening up ideas, really recognizing the engagement with the human and the non-human relationship within different practices and disciplines, um, within our practices of, of urban planning, where there's in urban planning a centrality of the human and maybe in, 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 in I is the human and the non-human, to open up more spaces for multiple perspectives and ways of understanding how these different human and non-human elements produce knowledge or ways of being in the world. Um, with responsiveness, we really want to cultivate the collective knowing uh, to understand where the social and material come together. For example, as students, facilitators, our discourse, what we, how we do, our face-to-face -face or online engagement, artifacts being produced, um, and being responsive to that and responsive to, to the shared collective within this. Um, we, we kind of looking at a way how society cannot be separated from this and the external and the internal within this and the materiality of technology and the affordances or the qualities thereof, as well as the impact of technology on innovation within this more complex web of how all of this is coming together. And then responding to that. So responding to ways of using this, of these, these multiple lenses, we apply design thinking in our approach. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when I talk about the rollout of the project. So responding to how we we view all of these things. So the design thinking phases, uh, we, we follow the Stanford School of Design with five phases um, of empathize, define, ideate, prototype and test. And the students were really um, brought on in terms of looking at uh, these different phases. They, we, we had a collaborative workshop where the students had to really look at problems within their local communities separately. So with the I students, um, we had an online session. Um, the urban planning students had a face-to-face -face session, but then we kind of combined what, what was identified. And then through this, we, we identified student groups. So really themes where there could be collaboration between them, and then we formed the groups as such. And they then had to really go through these phases to understand the project, this, this problem from the community's perspective. And they produce certain artifacts from that digital stories. They had to produce personas in terms of who the people are that we're designing for. And um, this was used to kind of roll out the project. And then from this, we had what we called the Maker Week where the teams were really brainstorming, coming up with different ideas, using certain tools such as Jamboards, um, where they really followed a way of, it, uh, of ideating, coming up with ideas 
in terms of digital innovations for within their communities for the, their projects. It's important to note that the students were seen as part of their community. So they were the community voice as well, because they couldn't really, within this online space, go into the communities um, as such, but the students really facilitated this within their own communities and then also tested the, the different prototypes and then we could design something from this. And the, there was really then the post-production, a reflection to bring in this reflexivity where the students could then reflect on what was done, what worked, what didn't work, and what this means for them. These are just some examples um, of uh, different teams where they came up with, with what was happening in their communities, what the problems were. A lot of the problems were situated around uh, pollution, urban um, problems around pollution um, and uh, quality, the, the quality within um, certain aspects around waste and um, dumping within their community. And then from this, they produce certain artifacts. These are the, the digital stories that they came up with. Um, they, the, their personas and their stories to kind of come up with the individual designs that they produced. And we there's not really enough time to, to, to show these, you these digital innovations, but there were a lot of different things, apps that they designed, um, uh, certain ways of con communities to engage via certain apps. And um, there were also some designs around recycling and ways to, to speed up recycling, etc. This will be for another presentation. Um, and then just to kind of reflect on, on, on what happened during our project, we, we, we really recognize that this, this online, the shift to online enforced uh, us to review our pedagogy and engage with, with the social and material entanglements that we have in projects such as this when we, when we could work in a digital space. And um, just the things that we, that we realized that really worked for us was, was to create openings for the students to, to embrace diverse perspectives um, and, and look at these interdisciplinary groups where there were different perspectives, different uh, practices, and we found that it was very important to facilitate a collaborative approach to co-construct knowledge. Um, this required multiple platforms for engagement. We had regular peer and facilitated feedback, and also we found very important was the pacing of, of, of the project um, to allow for enough time for things to to really percolate to the integrated and we, we needed to scaffold this taking place. And then also this co-constructing um, really helped them to, to work together, to think differently, to open up the space, to really start going more interdisciplinary, where they really started going without the, the with out, not within their own disciplines, but co-constructing something within a new discipline that was created within this, in, in this group. Um, and then also the interaction between the human and the technical within the learning space, uh, looking at kind of the complexities within these settings and recognizing that both the facilitators and the students are intrinsically linked to their social standing traditions and beliefs, and that you need learning spaces where you can experiment and explore different ways of working together and really opening up to experimentation within this. Um, we really started to shift our thinking about the influence of technology on learning to rather examine the social and the material where learning takes place interactively, so in time and space amongst screens, digital tools, facilitators, students, and other material engage and, um, 
engagements where where you start to look at the the, the way to foster agency within this um, thank you everyone for for your time for listening to us um please send any questions to us um, here's our emails um caro c fundenberg at uwc and belinda is the star b at cput.ac.za thanks a lot